Good afternoon, everyone. Lights are in my eyes a bit. I got to work this out. Can we dim the lights a bit? Is that possible? Thank you. Y'all can still see me, right? Yes. Yeah? And can you hear me in the back? This is good? Yeah. All right, sweet. Well, thank you for coming to my container security talk. Um, I really appreciate it. RVASEC is such a rad conference. I spoke here a few years ago. Uh, I'm really like pleased and honored to be invited to come back and appreciate all of you being here today. Um, I think that this is a good talk, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of the talks in the container space right now are through people affiliated with vendors, and you know that's good because those talks are actually quite good. Um, I've been to a few of them. They're really informative. I learn a lot. Uh, but there's something missing from the space, and that's you know like a little bit more raw honesty about the things that uh, the large companies could be doing better. Um, and if you work for Microsoft or Google, you're not really in a position to give that kind of a talk. Um, and when I initially crafted this, I was looking at doing that kind of work. It was a little more corporate. Um, I just launched a cryptocurrency-related startup, so uh, my co-founder really does not care. I will not get fired for you know, being very honest with you about what I'm seeing in the industry. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased about that. And I'm also really not shy. Uh, you may not know that yet, you'll figure it out really fast. Uh, and so you're very welcome to tag me on things. Um, I hope it's nice, but if it's not, okay. Um, I'm Elizabeth on Twitter, and Alyssa is off message on Instagram, and um, it's always really fun to see the posts and tweet them for me. So let's get started. Um, of the folks here, who has played around with Docker? Raise your hand. Cool, that's a lot of you. And uh, Kubernetes, raise your hand. A little bit less. Uh, maybe some other container product. Anyone here using containers other than that? Um, and of you folks, how many of you have thought about container security? You're playing around with some of the things there. OK, cool. Uh, decent number of you. Uh, hopefully, we can catch all of it. So in 2011, Mark Andreessen famously said, software is eating the world. And that seemed true. That was Silicon Valley in 2011. And you could say containers are eating software here in 2018. But also true, insecure defaults in containers are eating your AWS instances. It's less pithy, maybe. Uh, anyone have a better suggestion? Feel free to shout it out now or later. We could coin this better. So what is Docker? I don't know about you, I love seeing the marketing language, like how these companies are presenting themselves. Um, and it's not just the whimsy and the magic of everything they want to say, but you've got like the marketing team and the technical team, and it's like they don't talk. So the marketing team just says whatever they think is going to be good. One of Docker's promises, among other things, is security. They deliver applications safer across the entire lifecycle with built-in security capabilities and configurations out of the box. So, you know, they're kind of promising you can just use this. You don't have to do anything. Uh, so it's really not the fault of the user, in my opinion, when they open this up, they don't configure it, and they think they're going to be OK. Out of the box. But, you know, I don't want to talk too much about Docker, because Docker's kind of dead, sort of. The company, the corporate, the corporate entity. Uh, one of the co-founders just left, um, and Kubernetes is really eating their lunch. Um, so Docker's really interesting in terms of like exploits and vulnerabilities and all the things that are going on there. Um, but I think the focus really needs to start shifting to Kubernetes in terms of any research that we do. Um, and that's because the Docker business model isn't really working. Uh, they're giving all this stuff away for free without a way to monetize it, which I think is rad, actually, but it means that um, they may not have a way to keep, you know, everything afloat in the best possible way. Everybody's starting to switch and use Kubernetes. Um, so that's my explanation for why I'm emphasizing Kubernetes here. Happy to talk about it. Um, ask me questions either 
during the talk, after the talk, I'm on Twitter. What is Kubernetes? According to Google, Kubernetes is the industry-leading open source container orchestrator which powers Kubernetes engine. That's accurate. And the benefits are really good in the best possible conditions. You know, Kubernetes offers the possibility for this really great defense in depth. Um, they have this kind of neat explanation, the diagram of how it all works. So in theory, Kubernetes is really, really great for security. Um, and I'm bullish on the potential there uh, for companies that have the resources to do everything. But I'll stay another minute on the importance of Kubernetes. Google is actually saying that containers are the Google way. So all of you are here, and most of you have already played with containers, so this isn't really news for you, but I think it's noteworthy. Each week, we start over 2 billion containers. They say that in their Google Cloud website. So, you know, containers are a really big deal. And uh, for what it's worth, I'd encourage some of you to come into the container space because security is really sorely needed. Uh, we really need this, uh, and it's very hot right now. Um, yeah, so sure, there are all these exploits, and I kind of wish that I could come up here and like talk about the rainbows and Meltdown and Spectre and have that be like important. Um, but the truth is that it's really just about good old misconfiguration. Um, and in some ways, that's kind of a letdown and a disappointment, but I think it's also um, a tremendous opportunity because uh, there's so much misconfiguration out there and it's really fun to explore. Um, and it's also really important that we like start to call Google and these other companies out on their part in this. The core Kubernetes team calls many security issues misconfiguration. <laughs> but what do you call it when misconfiguration is the default? When you ship a default misconfiguration product, in the front row you're smiling, right? Like, can somebody, like, is anyone else upset about this? Not just me? <laughs> Say something. This, this, this is like really not okay, right? It's not okay. It's a bad practice. Bad Google did bad thing. Kubernetes has so many fun attack vectors, which are enabled by default. And I'm really in love with this image because it's not just a trash fire, it's a container on fire. <laughs> it's a container trash fire because I love trash. <laughs> I love trash. Yeah. I don't think it's that, you know, the maintainers of these programs actually love trash, but they love backwards compatibility and they love prioritizing features and they love, you know, scaling. So they love a lot of things and they don't love security. And when you don't love security at scale, you love trash. <laughs> so hacking Kubernetes. I want to talk just for a minute or two about, you know, what's trending in terms of hacking Kubernetes. And I know no one here would ever do any of these things. I never do any of these things. I actually don't do these things. Um, so we're used to ta taking strong measures to protect user data. For what it's worth, I think one of the reasons why it's kind of recent that we're making a big deal about container security is that a lot of the hacks haven't had high impact. Because uh, hackers are just going for the sweet, sweet S3 buckets, and they're not taking any of the data when they're there. They're just trying to mine for Monero. And, you know, th this is so hot that uh, you can find people like Random Robbie on Twitter, as random as you get. Random Robbie on Twitter is posting about how hackers are fighting over the clusters to mine. It's like my cluster, no, your cluster. Mine coin slash miner gate dash CLI. I don't know, you probably can't read the code. It says type Docker. <laughs> Image, mine coins, network none, port mappings, privileged, false, yeah. This is one of the most famous Kubernetes hacks and it's so famous that I'm like, oh, I shouldn't even talk about it. But um, I think sometimes when you're in a niche community, it seems like everybody knows something and then you go into the rest of the world and it's interesting again. Uh, of the folks here, who's heard of the Tesla 
attack where they had an unsecured Kubernetes, folks got in? Okay, so I'm not gonna bore you if I tell you a little bit about it. This is a big deal because it's Tesla. It's Tesla, Tesla gets hacked, that's meaningful. And we have expectations that Tesla is going to secure things. And also if Tesla can make this mistake with all of their resources, you know, it kind of seems like maybe the rest of us could also stumble along the same path. So here's what their Kubernetes cluster looked like with the access key and secrets, their AWS credentials. I'll tell you a bit about the hack. Monero miners infiltrated a Kubernetes console, uh, which was not password protected. And within, just not password protected, and within one pod, access credentials were exposed, um, and that's what they wanted. But this pod also contained an S3 bucket that had sensitive data such as telemetry. So there's like all this cool stuff in there, but they just wanted to hack Monero. <laughs> Look, when you're focused, you know what you want. In terms of detecting them, these hackers were really smart. They hid their IP address behind Cloudflare. The mining software was configured to listen on a non-standard port, and the CPU usage was not very high. So the hackers were able to configure the mining software to keep the CPU low, and that helps evade detection. There are a lot of lessons from the hacks that we see in the container space. Uh, and in cryptocurrency, but the truth is, like, none of them, with a few exceptions, are really special to containers. Um, so I give this talk in, like, developer environments with people who don't really know security, and I'm like, you should do updates, and they're like, I should do updates, yes, ah, very wise. I will, I, this, I'm so glad that you're here teaching me. Uh, and I kind of figure, you know, all of you know this, um, but it's worth saying quickly, uh, that it's important to update and monitor your configurations, secure your Kubernetes, monitor your network traffic. Um, I gave an example the other day that's really personal, but I think is kind of funny, so I'm gonna share it. Um, I used to be an Orthodox Jew. Um, that's its own story. Um, and Orthodox Jews have a saying, if you're not finding bugs, you're eating bugs. <laughs> And so, you know, if you're in your network and you're not finding hackers, you're eating bugs. <laughs> They're there. The bugs are in your lattice. It's just, do you look for them and do you find them or do you, do you just eat them? And a lot of people just eat them and it's fine. And you try not to think about it. You try not to think that you're eating bugs. And so it's the same thing with your network traffic. <laughs> you try to think that there aren't people in there. But they're probably in there and you just wanna, you wanna find them. It's better that you find them. So that's really important. Uh, and that hackers will leverage one resource to gain access to another. Kubernetes can be a gateway to S3. So hat tip to Redlock for their research here. Uh, and if anyone wants links to some of these things, I'm happy to share it. And the exploit that I'm about to show you has been an issue on GitHub since 2015. It was just patched. So, Good, you can, thank you for telling me. So, no, I'll, I'll, thank you. Tell me, I'll start over. So I didn't understand why there were security issues with, with Google's Kubernetes. Uh, and someone told me, well, they didn't expect it to be used in production. It, it, it took everyone by surprise. And that actually makes a lot of sense. Kubernetes was being used inside Google in ways that Google knew how to handle. And Google builds a lot of stuff. You know, they build a lot of things. Um, and they don't necessarily build everything to scale at an enterprise level, you know, around the world. Uh, and so now that Kubernetes is taking flight and is a really big deal, a lot of efforts are being made to prioritize security. And we see this issue is finally being patched. But it was open since 2015 because they weren't prepared. <laughs> Wasn't expecting it to be used in production. That said, uh, the comments by the Kubernetes team members are interesting, and I think it is okay to call them out for it uh, because it's a culture problem around security that they, should, um, they shouldn't be saying these things. 
So the first indicator of compromise with this specific exploit was a suspicious process, running as a child of the Docker daemon. Curling the endpoints leads to a mining proxy online, uh, and it was Alexander Ursioli at Handy who documented this. Uh, the, the hack didn't happen to Handy um, devices, but an employee who was at Handy had his own stuff that was hacked, and so like everyone at the team at Handy got to see it, and then they did a write-up. You can't really see it. Here's the code. It's the lock, stri lock script used to mine Monero. Uh, and just for an overview, the Kubernetes API server was publicly exposed to the internet. And by default, the requests that are not rejected were treated as anonymous requests, given a username of system anonymous and a group of system unauthenticated. Uh, and people knew about this because uh, it was an open issue on GitHub. Uh, so it was an open known vulnerability, fairly easy to exploit. Unless you specified some flags on Kubelet, it's a default mode of operation to accept the unauthenticated API requests. So I, I think that's a problem. Here's the issue on GitHub. Secure Kubelet's uh, component config defaults while maintaining CLI compatibility. So you see the compatibility maintenance um, was one reason why they didn't want to do the merge. We've got um, a user on GitHub, uh, from what I can see, just like random user, is there any CVE for this? No. Running in production without enabling kubelet auth and authes is a misconfiguration, not a CVE. Right? No, it's not a CVE. <laughs> not a CVE. Really? Well, who said that? Jordan Liggett. Okay, fine, some dude says that. No, not just some dude. Developer program manager, organizations, Google Cloud, and Kubernetes. So the core Kubernetes team is looking at these things and saying, the users need to configure this better. It's not an issue. <laughs> I think it's an issue. Maybe Jordan's gonna discover this and get mad at me. Hi, Jordan. You should fix this. Say you're sorry. <laughs> Jordan, say you're sorry. Uh, lesson. So it's very important to pay attention to configuration. Um, so Google likes to promote Kubernetes right now as being like really easy to set up. If you go to these conferences, I was just at KubeCon, uh, and Google has their big booth, um, and they really encourage you to just get started on Kubernetes. And the truth is, it is easy to get up and running really fast. I was up and running, I don't know, five to 10 minutes. Um, but someone came to me after, and he's like, I have this up and running, but are my configurations right? It's like, well, there's a lot there, and that's gonna take you a lot longer. Um, yeah, and you have to patch, of course, and patching can be really difficult. Um, I was just speaking, to some government folks in DC, and they're like, yeah, we, we can't just patch things. <laughs> so explaining Kubernetes for fun and profit, no, through, they, they do have an appropriate disclosure process. Tools for us. Shodan. Uh, raise your hand if you love Shodan. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so the truth is I'm actually still kind of new to the container space compared to the other people who go around and give these talks. Um, but I wanted to come here and kind of share like stuff that I've discovered and I haven't necessarily had the time to go down all the rabbit holes, but I found this and I was like, I will bring this here and you will go down that rabbit hole. Um, and so I invite you to do that. Um, and if you do, please let me know because I think it's kind of fun, I'll be happy for you. If you go to Shodan, you just type in Kubernetes master, 16,841 results. There's a lot of Kubernetes that's open to the internet. And it's not only that, there are so many known vulnerabilities. In one blog post, credentials, credentials, credentials everywhere. Things like CMS admin, MySQL root, Postgres, Here's a known vulnerability that really should be closed. It'll leak internal passwords, AWS keys, certificates, 
because this API interface is accessible and it's not secured by default. And they know it and they publish it. They will tell you they're not embarrassed. I would be really embarrassed. I don't embarrass easily, but I'd be so embarrassed. I just couldn't. I don't know how they sleep. <laughs> they must do a lot of drugs. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I have to call them up. Be like, how do you live with yourself? Tell me your secret. <laughs> so here in their authentication guide, and I'll read it for the folks in the back, from ETCD, which calls itself a distributed, reliable key value store for the most critical data of a distributed system. I'll just read that part again. The most critical data of a distributed system. <laughs> Authentication having users and roles was added in ETCD 2.1. This guide will help you. EC ETCD before 2.1 was a completely open system. Anyone with access to the API could change keys to preserve backward compatibility and upgradability. This feature is off by default. Hello, Showdown. <laughs> so um, there's a blog post written up that details like all of the different things you can do with Showdown, um, and I'd be happy to share it. Again, if anyone wants to see like the blog post and the different links, um, I'll bring my Twitter back up, and I'll also be around for a few minutes after the talk. So when it comes to securing Kubernetes, Part of the problem is it's just so complicated. Uh, there are CIS benchmarks. Um, who here is familiar with uh, the CIS benchmarks? Yeah, a lot of you. They're really good, right? They're really good. You have CIS benchmarks for Docker, and you have CIS benchmarks for Kubernetes. So if you're you know, Google or Tesla or some really big organization, you can like sit that down <laughs> in front of the team, and they can like work through it. But the CIS benchmarks have over something like 250 line items for Kubernetes, and they're not prioritized. It's a lot. It's really hard to go through that and understand what to do. And uh, it's very difficult. Uh, yes, yeah, so let's talk about some common vulnerabilities. Kubelets expose HTTPS endpoints. By default, kubelets allow unauthenticated access to this API. That's from the Kubernetes Guide to Securing a Cluster. Kubernetes is publishing this themselves. They're writing this. They're sharing this. So some common vulnerabilities. Huh? And here is the Medium link for you. This is a really great read. Hat tip to the author. Uh, unsecured dashboards, port 10250, TCP open. Port 2379, TCP open. There's a lot there. Where are we on time, please? Excellent. That's where I want to be. Tools for hardening. Uh, folks here, who's interested in hardening uh, your Kubernetes? That's interesting. If it's not interesting, raise your hand, not interesting. OK, no one like really doesn't want to hear about it. OK. So, some tour so there are a lot of tools, but it can be hard to figure out like which ones are really good. Um, I like Clara by Core OS. A lot of people like that. Static analysis of vulnerabilities in uh, the Docker containers. Kubebench is good. Kubebench is really good. Checks whether Kubernetes is deployed securely against the CIS Kubernetes benchmarks. Those benchmarks are complicated, so that's really neat. And it looks like this. Pass, fail. <laughs> Pass, fail. I like Heptio. Heptio is a really good company, by the way. I am unaffiliated with all of these companies, but Heptio is a neat place to work. If any of you are looking for roles, I can connect you. Um, so Heptio has some tools that I think are really useful. Uh, they're a good org. Uh, founded by one of the original Kubernetes founders. Um, CIS benchmarks, such a long list. It's too long a list. The tools made by Google are unsurprisingly really good. Container registry vulnerability scanning identifies package vulnerabilities for your container images. 
and Google is always introducing new stuff, an open source API to audit and govern your entire supply chain, because you have to think about that with containers. So sometimes I like to stop on this one, which I will. Does anyone have any interesting stories about containers or Kubernetes? Just seeing like who's here and the show of hands before, I imagine one or two of you have seen something kind of interesting. Anyone have a story to tell? Something you've seen with your uh, Kubernetes or Docker at work? Yes, no? In the back? All right, we keep going then. So best practices via the Kubernetes team. There are some things that are unique for containers. Implement continuous security vulnerability scanning. Containers might have outdated packages with known vulnerabilities. And new vulnerabilities are, of course, published every day. Regularly apply security updates. Yes, we know that. <laughs> Ensure that only authorized images are used in your environments. Limit direct access to Kubernetes nodes. Create boundaries between resources. Define resource quota. Implement network segmentation. And log everything. Best practices via Docker. Only trusted users should be allowed to control your Docker daemon and remove all capabilities except those explicitly required. So, you know, like basic security best practices. It's just the configurations are so complicated. Proper tooling, how to run your Linux kernel. I'm going to go through this really fast. You already know all this stuff. I'm going to go back here and push you a little bit harder. Uh, does anyone have any questions or any stories relating to things that you've seen? Silence. No. <laughs> hmm. Yes. What did you say? That's fun. Docker containers on Linux, by default, have root access. How did you discover this? Or where did you see it? Yeah, it could be a problem in theory. <laughs> so is your company going to do anything about it? Or you're just like, root access is open. It's fine. Right, that makes sense. Well, and that's how these things come to pass, right? Like Kubernetes was originally not designated for that. Um, in the back, anyone else seen something along these lines? Anyone have any questions? Anyone mad at the Jordan guy? <laughs> it's a misconfiguration. I do end this short and leave a little time for questions. So um, we should do that or else I'll just send everyone home, uh, which I guess is fine too. It's a really fun con and there's a lot to do here. Um, any questions? Please. Yes. So, Open is good, right? Open, warm, fuzzy. You know, I'd have to ask them about that and get more color on it. Um, I think it, it's a question of prioritization, right? Like, if they look at their resources and it's a limited team and they say, we could make this secure or we could maintain backwards compatibility, um, it, I'm not sure that it's okay to say that they're choosing something besides security. And the reason is all of these companies and people are running things in an insecure way and they're putting their users at risk. And so there's this ethical question like, is it better to have a product that more people can use but they're using it insecurely and they're at risk but at least they get the benefit of the cool new tool? Or is it better to make sure that your tool works properly all the time for everyone? So I'd rather that my tool always works okay. 
Um, and I would like to encourage and enforce other companies and people to make that choice. A lot of companies just want to make sure they have as many users as possible. They believe in like the new features that their tool brings. And I guess I can accept that I'm saying that everybody needs to figure out like how to upgrade. It's definitely a problem on like how to make sure that everyone, regardless of income, is able to have secure and usable tools. But I think if we start prioritizing security, we'll start to make more progress towards doing that. Does that answer your question? Right. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not sure how much these decisions are being made outside the Kubernetes maintenance team, and it's an open source project. So, you know, I think um, unless this talk like makes it way further up the chain inside Google and I get some phone call, which I don't think is going to happen, uh, you just have this like small crew of people managing an open source project and doing their best with their limited resources and definitely not coming from a security background, but now being used at scale. Anyone else, comments, questions? Yes, I think I do see, yes, in the back. Yeah, that's a great question. So that question is for people who are involved in incident response, what are the things that you should be doing? Uh, the biggest thing, obviously, uh, is just to really know your network um, and to maintain really good forensics. Um, one thing that's a little unique with containers um, is like containers tend to be destroyed and that's really normal. Like you destroy containers and then you build new ones. Uh, that's the thing that I've noticed that seems to be unique um, from a forensics perspective, like you want to make sure you have a process in place where like containers that relate to an incident aren't destroyed, that you're able to like have a scan of that or like have a copy of that. Um, so that's like kind of neat because it's unique to containers. Um, but the big thing that most people don't do is just knowing their network and monitoring their network. That's like not common enough practice in smaller companies. Um, but you're already in this industry, you know the importance of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, anyone else? One more? Comment? Heckle? Random question? If not, then I'll let y'all go uh, so the next speaker can get things set up because uh, this took a little bit longer because of some issues that were happening. Um, so I'll give them that bit of extra time that I also had. Um, all right, if you don't have any questions or comments, I'll be hanging out here. Uh, happy to send you showdown, anything you want to see. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to bring my Twitter back up. Oh, yeah. A round of applause for me. <laughs>